Also remember, as soon as a patient goes unconscious, this airway is their primary risk. As soon as they go unconscious, the tongue slumps to the back of the throat, the airway becomes occluded, stomach content starts to run forward, up into the back of the throat, and if we're not monitoring it carefully, we very quickly have a cardiac arrest, or a drowning, choking, or, a, or, or a asphyxiated ca casualty. So, when patients are on spinal boards, when patients are on scoops, when patients are lying flat on their back, and are unconscious, the airway is your main priority. Airway before breathing, before circulation. The only thing that supersedes that, obviously, is a catastrophic bleed, where they'll bleed to death very, very quickly from an arterial bleed, so that takes priority, but airway is always going to be the starting point for any assessment, and it should also be the finishing point, because when we finish the top-to-toe survey, we come back to make sure the airway hasn't changed in any way, shape, or form. If we do anything that may change the way that airway is working, we must always go back and double-check it. One of the easiest and simple ways to keep a check on an airway while you're doing your assessment is talk to your casualty. If they're talking back to you, they're talking appropriately, they're not struggling to breathe, keep talking. Because all the time you're talking, you're monitoring their airway. If anything changes, you will pick it up immediately. But if you don't talk to your patient, if you don't communicate with your patient, they can very quickly arrest, occlude their airway, and you don't even notice it's happened for possibly 30, 40, 50 seconds. That's 30, 40 or 50 seconds longer than it would have taken you if you'd have been talking and communicating with your patient at all times. Plus it reassures assures them their breathing is always easier if they are confident, if they are calm, if they are feeling involved and if they're not frightened. Communication is the key to all assessments. Tell your patient what you're doing, talk to your patient while you're doing it and tell them what you find. But bear in mind we don't want to frighten the patient. So finally we're going to have a look at very briefly, one or two of the conditions that we've talked about in a little bit more depth. Firstly, we've got the pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is where air leaks through the chest wall into the cavity itself. From things like gunshot wounds, stabbing injuries, stabbing uh, situations where we've got a hole from the outside to the inside. Air, as it comes into the lung, will leak out of the lung and out of the chest wall itself. And then as we breathe the opposite way or relax, it sucks back in and fills the cavity. The lung will deflate. For this type of injury, we put a one-way seal, a chest, and ash, sorry, an Asherman chest seal or a Russell's chest seal to allow a one-way valve to allow it out, but not air back in again. We can have a tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax is where there's no hole to the outside of the chest, but there is a hole in the lung itself. That leaks air out of the lung into the cavity around the lung or the, that the lung sits in and starts to deflate the lung itself. Those can happen also, especially with the young and especially with people who've grown quite tall quite quickly, as what we call a spontaneous pneumothorax, where the lung literally can just form a hole and burst. As I said, it tends to happen in tall, lanky, young people who've grown fast and the tissue has become delicate and burst. They can also happen the same way with things like blast injuries and explosions and vacuum problems where a bomb or an explosion has gone off and actually what we call the paper bag effect where the lung itself just pops due to pressure changes. Hemothorax, basically where we've got blood leaking into the lung itself and filling up. These are the ones you'll see where basic doctors may have seen it on TV, may have seen it in RTCs, crashes and this type of stuff, where doctors penetrate through the side of the chest wall, put a tube in and drain the blood out. Because unless we get the air out and the blood out, they all affect the way the lung functions. The way the lungs function affects the way the heart beats. And if there's not enough oxygen going through your lung and your circulatory system due to a blockage, due to a burst, due to a puncture, due to a bleed, there's not enough oxygen going around your system, eventually it will turn into a fatal incident. We need to have that oxygen going in and functioning properly to keep the patient alive. So look at what you can see, look at the way the position of the patient is, look at what you can hear or listen to what you can hear with the chest itself. Remember to percuss for sound, listen with stethoscopes and make your decisions from the mechanism, from the trauma that has caused or potentially caused the internal problems themselves.